We're back. It's us. We are. <laughs> we're back. Me, you thought we were gone. <laughs> Lauren's folks' cats, and we got a whole full house today. We do. We do. Just Hopefully, they'll make an appearance. I, uh, they know. will. Yeah. If you bring the cats on, I'm going to get my dog. So we'll see. Oh, yeah. I like it. Anyway, welcome back, everybody, to our little ongoing series. Oh, I got to tell you a fire and ice story. Remind me where we hang up <laughs> Um, fire and ice. Fire and I'm so ice. excited. I ran across it today, and I'm again. I'm laughing like a fool by myself. Nobody knows why. Um, <laughs> so anyway, but, but we are we are fire and ice. We are officially fire and ice now. That is the name of our disco band. So welcome to our show. And uh, there will be a lack me, of singing. <laughs> there will be a lack of singing. Joining me as always on this side is Lauren Rosen, LMFT, licensed marriage and family therapist from the great state of California. Welcome back. Thank you. And if yes. you're joining from my end of things, oh no, it's not. You mirrored it, man. You tr you fooled me. I was so excited that I was on it. <laughs> that is Drew Linsalata, the anxious truth, the dot anxious dot truth on Instagram. Go check him out. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So today we're going to do something a little different. We're going to talk about what to do. This was Lauren's idea, by the way. She gets full credit for an excellent idea. What do you do when you get triggered? Like, <sighs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just like, stand there and you let the flames envelop you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, a little bit. I, I'm not a huge fan of the trigger. I mean, look, triggers are real. I'm not saying they're not real, but I'm always a f I'm always wary of the term trigger because yeah. usually in online circles, it's used as an avoidance term. Like, oh, trigger warning. This might trigger you. Can't get triggered. Right. Can't get triggered. So that's such um, a good point. I actually, uh, uh, Kelly, Frankie, and I were on Kevin Foss's podcast, Fearcast, talking about just that, the, the problem with trigger warnings and that it makes it seem like there's something wrong with being triggered, which is not true, actually. It's a very, it's actually, I posted about this just this weekend. It's a great sign. It's a yeah. great sign of you're triggered. It means that you are out and that you are living your life. And yeah. Correct. And a trigger is just an opportunity to practice in the end. So absolutely. Yeah. The trigger better. Okay. So let's talk about it. How do you practice? So the, the question would be like, okay, now you get triggered. You were hoping not to be, of course, nobody wants to get triggered, but you do. Your anxiety is triggered. What do we do? So. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And we were talking about in the context of going into some examples and like in the context of agoraphobia um, you brought up an excellent example of, you know, you're sitting, minding your own business when you get a call and there's a meeting that you have to go to and, and, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah. oh no, yeah. I'm triggered. Yeah. Full blonde. Okay. We could use that. We were talking about, okay, we'll try and give a specific example. So we'll talk to agoraphobia. That was, that was definitely my issue. And so typically for me, it would be wake up in the morning and this is before I was actually getting better and doing what I had to do. And my life was just full of avoidance. It would be like, let's just keep our fingers and toes crossed today that nothing comes up that will force me to do scary things. So I lived in constant fear that the phone would ring or something. I was in the technology business. I mean, I still am, but you know, a little more hardcore at the time. Uh, my data center was full of servers and racks and racks and racks of servers. And those things would go down because it happens sometimes. Oh my God, please there, let there not be a problem at the data center. Please let me not have to go three miles away to my office. Please let me not have to, whatever. Um, so typically that's how I would start the day, hoping that I would be able to get through it without having to do anything scary. Mm. But sometimes that wasn't, that didn't happen that way. And the phone sometimes might ring. The phone would ring. Yeah. The phone would ring or an email would come in or I would get a text message from the network monitoring systems telling me that there's a problem of some kind and that that problem required my in-person interaction. Couldn't do it remotely. Couldn't do it on the phone. There was no Zoom. There was no Zoom at no. the time. So, yeah, had to do had to do it. So that was a trigger for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. what when that happened for you? I can imagine that a lot of thoughts and feelings would come about as a direct result of the email or the phone call. Like something like. Mm -hmm. I'm, and I, I don't know specifically what would come up for you, but oftentimes with agoraphobia, agoraphobia more generally, it's I'm, I have to leave. I'm going to have a panic attack. I'm going to lose control. I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to die. Right. Yeah. Like some variation of those fears because I have to leave my home. Yeah. Pretty much nailed it. Yeah. I would immediately, as soon as I knew that I had no choice. So if I was 
so it was interesting. There would be potential trigger. Okay, here's a possible situation that's going to make me do a scary thing. And yeah. if I was able to wiggle around it, I would be able to remote it or something. Well, you know, somebody else could take care of it. Okay, whew, disaster averted. Yeah. But as soon as I was faced with a potential trigger, immediately my level of agitation would rise. Immediately. My yeah. physical level of discomfort would rise. My heart would begin to pound. I would begin to sweat. I would begin to breathe very deeply. All of those things would start to happen. I'd get a little bit derealized and a little bit disoriented. So even if I thought I might have to go to the data center or get in the car and drive anywhere by myself, I would start to experience that. When it did become an actual trigger, like, no, I really have to do it. Those things would ramp instantly into full panic. Mm. Yeah. So that's a pretty accurate description. I would get very anxious. And then if I knew I got to go, boom, instantaneous panic. Hmm. So I would go right from level six to level 15. This one yeah. goes to 15. Like spinal tap. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so that's what it would look like for me. And I'm guessing that this is probably generalizable in general terms across multiple totally. disorders. Totally. And I think that that's a good point. Like if we touch upon how it could be made manifest, uh, you know, if we look at OCD and I'll, I'll even take an example from my own history, because that's the game we're playing today, I think. Uh, is, so if when I had, I had my primary obsession when I entered treatment was if I had relapsed on a piece of tiramisu, because I had been sober for several years at the time and I ate this piece of tiramisu and I wasn't sure what my intentions were about eating this piece of tiramisu. So I spent, you know, two years trying to sort through and figure out what my genuine intentions were and whether or not I had relapsed. And so if I were going throughout my day in the midst of that, I, I imagine actually we're driving on uh, the valley and there's a, a restaurant that's called tiramisu. And so like, I, I lived in the valley for a time if I were just sort of like driving along and, and minding my own business and all of a sudden I'd see that sign, it would be, oh my gosh. You, you may have forgotten this, but you might have relapsed on this piece of tiramisu that you ate several years ago. What if you did? Or even uh, that's the, the wild thing about triggers is that the longer that you have the disorder, the more associations they build. Mm-hmm. And so I could talk to somebody who I knew from a job at California Pizza Kitchen. That's right. I used to work at California Pizza Kitchen. And I, th- the place where I ate the tiramisu was at somebody's uh, bridal shower who worked at California Pizza Kitchen too. So if I'm now thinking about California Pizza Kitchen, well, now I'm thinking about the tiramisu, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Or somebody talks about being genuinely honest with themselves. Well, now I'm Am I being genuinely honest? So it can trigger you because anything. And at that point, my stomach would drop. My my heart would start to, to beat more quickly. But more than anything, that, that strong urge to figure things out would just completely overtake me. And I'd either you know, ruminate about it for a while and try and sort it out internally, or I, you know, make a phone call to one of the the few people who was still willing to talk to me about this <laughs> and ask for some reassurance about whether or not I, you know, it was, it did constitute a relapse. Okay. I, I like, you know, this is really good. So the, for me, we're talking about sort of an agoraphobia trigger, but really, um, and, and I mean, you could probably confirm this as an, a working clinician underneath agoraphobia is gen- very few people have agoraphobia without panic disorder, right? That's right. an extremely rare situ- circumstance. So, I mean, I know it can exist, but it's pretty rare for me. The panic disorder led to the agoraphobia. So really it was mm-hmm. a panic trigger. It wasn't an agoraphobia trigger. And right. when you say that your range of triggers began to expand, okay, now this reminds me of terms. So this reminds me of that. This reminds me of that. Same thing would hold true for me. So yes, we're specifically talking about today, I got triggered because I got a phone call and I had to run to the data center in 2006 and I I was afraid to do that. But really my range of panic triggers got bigger and bigger also. Mm. Uh, An argument, a feeling really happy, 
Uh, I remember the New York Giants won the the Super Bowl, and I had a panic attack mm. after the game. It was mm. super exciting. It came down to the very end. They beat the Patriots like eat it, Tom Brady. Like as a lifelong Giant fan, it was very exciting, but it triggered panic after the game. Yeah. So like that just yeah. anything, your phone would ring a different sound, like anything, everything would begin to like, oh no, I might, I might feel a thing. And then I'm afraid of that. And it would just roll into panic. So I agree with you. Yeah. The deeper it got, the broader the range of potential triggers. And that's what leads to that avoidance of like, no, no, no. I just have to make sure that I try to keep it on the straight level. No big emotions, no big feelings in my house. Blah, yeah. That's what we need. That's what today should be. Let's keep our fingers crossed. So anyway. Totally. Yeah. Well, and that's, yeah, there becomes more and more over time to your point to be avoided. And then your life gets increasingly smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and that doesn't always happen with OCD. You know, I, certainly avoidance comes up as, as a way to deal with the anxiety. But um, it's, I, I certainly avoided things. I, it transcended to fears about it might contaminated if I was out with friends or something like that. So avoid yeah. going to a party or something that would, that would trigger that. But one way or another, you're, even if you're there physically, if you're caught up doing compulsions, wh whether in conversation with somebody or mentally, you're not really there. You're not. Or if we take something else like uh, being triggered in the context of contamination concerns, you might not go, not because you're avoiding the place, but because you're too busy washing, right? You might not be connected in your life because, or with locking compulsions, right? You might be over and over again with the door and you're not willing to leave, not because you're anxious about whatever it is you're going to, but because you're unwilling to tolerate the anxiety that would come from leaving. Yeah. That's a hundred percent on that. From my analog and that would be okay, I have no choice. I have, this is my business. I own the business and I don't, and I won't go to it. I mean, that's terribly embarrassing. Mm. Um, okay. I have no choice. I have to go. And I would just white knuckle my way through it and just grit my teeth. And yeah, I was there, but I wasn't really there because my yeah. entire focus was not on helping this particular customer or helping one of my employees or taking care of business. My entire focus was on just trying to moderate and mediate and, and flatten my, my internal experience. Totally. Right, so internal experiential avoidance. I don't want to experience this thing internally, which is triggered by this external thing. So I'll go to the external thing, but it's really, I'm just going to be completely internally focused yep. on my, my body. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's no I, think, I think it generalizes too beyond our two disorders, right? If we're looking at health anxiety, same thing. You get triggered around, you know, you see something that reminds you of cancer and all of a sudden you're back to trying to figure out whether or not you have cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, or when we're looking at specific phobias, like with, let's say, dogs or spiders, that you're going to find yourself avoiding those or then going and getting close to those things. But the whole time you're doing all of these sort of more subtle safety behaviors that are keeping you from being engaged. Yeah. So then the, the topic today is technically, uh, how do you navigate once once triggered? What happens then? I think it's the million dollar question that most people want to ask, but tell me what to do then. Yeah. And normally phrased as, how do I overcome? How do I handle? But how do I, can you give me tips on how to handle that? Yeah. So I think what we're probably talking today about is handling. How do you handle it when you do get triggered? Now, too, too, too bad. Now the snowball's rolling down the hill. You can't stop it. So what do you do? Right. Right. Yeah. Well, and I imagine that you and I both have like slightly different variations on how how we would go about dealing with that. But the I'm from my vantage point, the first step is first of all recognizing that, oh, I'm anxious, like and I'm having thoughts. Because without that recognition, without recognizing that there are thoughts and feelings that are coming up here, that you can't effectively navigate the circumstance. I, I agree with that. So there's almost that you have to have an acknowledgement of this is the this is the situation I'm in. And there's almost that has to be almost an objective, which is hard to get to it takes time mm -hmm. to get to that an objective assessment of what's going on right now. I'm experiencing extreme discomfort and fear because of these thoughts and sensations. Yes. 
That's it. Yep. That's the end of the story. That's the situation right now. I can't yeah. I have to stop the story right there for me. Yes. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, oh, it 100%. Because then if you start going further into the story, you're going to actually end up kicking off more emotional yep. challenges um, yeah. as opposed to just accepting the natural rise and fall by trying to mitigate the experience. You're actually making it worse. Well, there you go. That, so mitigate the experience, I think, is the key here. For me, what I would do initially when triggered was to try to mitigate the experience. Now mm -hmm. I have to find a way to bring my heart rate down. I have to start, find a way to breathe slower. I have to find a way to not feel so flushed or hot or freezing because I would have these crazy temperature swings. I was sweating and then I was freezing and it, it was no good. Mm -hmm. um, so I would try to actively manage that or I would start to, I would have thoughts like, you know, how am I going to possibly get back to three miles back home? If I go here, now I have to get back. How am I going to do that? Yeah. So, and I would start to argue with myself and have what if scenarios. What if I have to call 911? What if I have to call for help? I was, oh, I was trying to mitigate both the thoughts and the physical sensations. So that was my initial response when triggered. So, which I think leads to that's so perfect because the next step really is in after you've recognized that the thoughts and feelings are po are present that you're mm. not going to do anything to try to fix control change them is the next step yeah but it did require that first step because the without that first step of acknowledging no no i have to boil this down to i'm thinking and i'm feeling that's all that's happening right now i'm thinking and feeling i would focus on the the potential disastrous outcome i'm stuck at the data center i pass out i have a heart attack i i'm dying right that's not that none of that needed to be solved because none of that was actually happening. I just had to relate better to the underlying thing, which was I'm having an, ex, an internal experience. I'm thinking and feeling right now. Yes. And I'm unwilling to sit with the possibility that these things might come to pass. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the new way to navigate for me was, yes, I have to acknowledge what's going on. And now I have to recognize that, no, 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 I actually have to perform the task at hand now, which is I have to get in my, I have to put on my shoes. I have to put on my jacket. I have to tie my shoes. I have to turn the key in the ignition. I literally begin to breaking those things down into the tiniest little, and all I have to do mm -hmm. now is, was tremendously helpful mm -hmm. to me. All I have to do in the entire world right now is put my key in the ignition. I had a key yeah. in those days. So, um, I still, I still have that. <laughs> yeah, Two cars I have now have keys. What am I going to say? Um, but yes, all I have to do is this. So instead of being focused on trying to prevent this imagined outcome, I just had to bring my focus back to what I'm doing now and recognize like, no, my heart is going to pound now. Mm -hmm. I, I, my breathing is going to be ragged. I can try to control my breathing, but not frantically. And if I can't, I can't. I will sweat. Right. My legs will shake. I will feel disoriented. I'm just going to have to do these things one at a time while I feel that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that it, was it, to navigate. Yeah. So in terms of like making it a stepwise process as to what we've spoken about thus far, first we uh, notice that we're having thoughts and feelings. We're able to happening. And there are allowing for those experiences to be present instead of resisting them. So uh, it, while the desire, the urge to mitigate what's happening, right, like that may come up, we're not going to do that. Instead, quite to the contrary, we're going to go toward more thoughts and more feelings on purpose because in the direction of more thoughts and feelings is life, is doing the things that matter to you, that are meaningful to you, that, that are necessary if you want to, you know, keep doing the things that matter. It's an excellent point because I was avoiding doing things that I really desperately did want to do. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to be stuck in my, I don't want to hide in my house. I didn't want to worry about the phone ring. I didn't want to, I didn't want to live that way yet. I was avoiding the very things that that was. I was avoiding the thing that I actually wanted to go toward as crazy as that is. It sounds ridiculous when I say it out loud. Well, but, but that is the power of, of the, the experiential avoidance, these thoughts and feelings that we don't want to have. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. And, and if it really boils down, I think, to the goal, because if the goal is comfort at any cost, then of course we're going to do that. Mm -hmm. right? if, if that's what the end game is, that we just want to feel good, then we are going to be constantly 
buffeted and battered by our feelings. If the goal is I want to live a full life regardless, then that changes the whole, the, the whole experience because now you're like, okay, well, I'm going to be, I'm going to feel my heart pounding while I tie my shoe and I'm yeah. going to allow myself to sweat as I walk toward my car. Yeah. Which is what I had to do. So now it's funny because when we talk about navigating through the trigger, once triggered, what I, and I think this probably holds true for most of the community listening, what I would have told you was navigating was definitely not navigating. Hmm. So I think most people, when they, if they're going to tune into this and that's, this is the clickbait title of the YouTube video, like, Ooh, they're going to tell me how to navigate my, my anxiety triggers. They're probably hoping to hear, this is how you calm down. This is mm -hmm. how you ground. This is how you make it stop. This is how you make the panic go away. This is how you calm your thoughts or change your thoughts. But that's not navigating. Mm -mm. That's no. eradicating. That's a ra and We've already to been there. We're not going to, we're not going to eradicate. Right. We're, we're going to navigate. Back. Right. So oh. I think what I was thinking was navigation was really focused on eradication to bring it back to our last video. That's like, so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. If I look back on that, I'm like, oh, navigating to me was how do I make this stop? How do I make yeah. this go away? But really that's not navigating at all. I wasn't. No, that's such a good point. And I think as you're continuing, like, as, as you are navigating the experience, one thing I want to point to is that you don't stop having thoughts and you don't, like we've been talking a lot about the emotional experience that mm -hmm. sort of continues throughout as evidenced by all of these physical symptoms that you're having. But in addition, every step, I imagine, even if you weren't engaging with the thoughts was, you might not make it home. You might have a panic attack. You might, yeah. you know, you might get stuck. You might, and I, again, the, the, it's choose your own adventure at this point, right? Like, and yes. then I die a horrible death because I have a panic, a panic attack while I'm driving and I can't focus on the road or whatever, yeah. whatever thing uh, your brain comes up with in that moment. But part of taking those steps, like walking toward your car is being willing to have this guy in your brain screaming at you that all of these bad things are going to happen. Yeah. And, and the answer from my perspective to that, as you're accepting the feelings and part of accepting the feelings, accepting the uncertainty, accepting the experience is saying, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. For me, it was, and this only came from experience, by the way. So I think mm -hmm. we could tell you like, well, here, this is really what navigating truly means. This is what I did to really navigate. But that didn't happen after my second panic attack. That took mm -hmm. many, many panic attacks. And unfortunately for me, multiple years, many years of doing it the wrong way and remaining stuck. Mm -hmm. So I can't, you know, it's not like, oh, yeah, okay, no problem. I just figured out how to do this. But for me, part of that was not just accepting the unknown, but I would literally begin to think, show, okay, now show me. Yeah. Like I'm so tired of living in my house and not, and not being, and being afraid to go to my own place of business that I own. You're, okay. So every time that little voice would say, oh my God, this is so, this has to be something really wrong now. Now mm -hmm. it really feels like I'm slipping away when I would get the realize it would feel like I was slipping away or disintegrating in some way. This, this has to be happening now. My response became, I'm going to keep moving forward. Show me then. You keep saying that. Now you're going to have yeah. to show me. Yeah. I don't know if that, yeah. If that helped at all, that was a, for me, that was a framing statement. Show me. Yeah. Well, because yeah. it empowers you. Right. Yeah, and it, it when you. Easy. No, oh, no, that's yeah. <laughs> for sure. But, but it, it is, if we're working towards something, then empowerment is certainly something that is worth working toward. And that yeah. actually has sort of a positive emotional output. Not that we do it for that, but the, the, the sort of willingness to feel all of that stuff is, it, so, it feels I, good. It does feel good. And the way I was able to change my definition of navigation, and I swear we're going to get back to navigating, but the way I changed the definition and actually began to more successfully and productively navigate was I had to reach a certain level of fed upness. That's a word. I just coined it. Yeah. So. I had to be like annoyed that. enough, angry enough, just enough, enough of everything. No more. I'm not doing this anymore that I would be able to frame that with like, okay, you're going to have to show me this time. You're going to have to kill me. And if you really do try, then I guess I'll call 911 and hopefully they save me. 
but that's yeah. what it's going to take. Cause I'm not going to go back in that. Office now. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Did you yeah. have that, any of that in your, when you changed? I, I had a point where I was like, this is not, I'm not going to let this completely control me anymore. Like I'm just not. Um, and I think there had to be a, well, and it was interesting because I realized I really wasn't living. I wasn't living my life based on my values or what was most meaningful to me. Um, so ultimately, you know, dis disengaging from the questioning was me saying like, okay, well, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm not going to have the answer. I'm not going to, I'm not going to continue to figure it out. And I, I think that that was in my own way, my defiance of like, I, I guess, and I've certainly since and then had experiences where it's like, bring it on, you know, like I, I okay. Because, and I think having Reed Wilson talks about this a lot. He talks about the idea of wanting the anxiety. Yeah. And it sort of strikes me as a similar flavor, but I, oh, I cool. love, but I do really love this idea of like, you're going to have to kill me then. Like that's, that's the option that I'm taking. And that's essentially any time that I ask a client to accept uncertainty about whether or not they want to murder their families or whether or not they're secretly a pedophile or, mm. you know, what have you that I'm saying you have to accept that the worst case scenario is on the table because it's that unwillingness to accept that that's yeah. been keeping them in the loop. And so while it may not be, I, you're going to have to kill me. It's like, you may find yourself like, well, if that's it, then I guess we'll see. I guess, right. I guess we'll find out. I guess I'll uh, kill my family and go to jail then. And I, like, that's mm. sounds horrifying, right? To somebody, but what is the other choice? And when your brain has basically taken you hostage. Uh, that's great. The hostage thing. Cause I think in the end, that's what it was. It was, you'll have to kill me was essentially like, I, I am not, I'm not going to have you drag me up and down anymore. Right. No. This is just the way it's going to have to be. But I think, and, and I wrote about this too. And I wrote my books, like people will say all the time, but I don't understand. I get it. I know I'm not going to kill my family. Like I'm sure most of your clients would say, well, but I know that that's not really true, but it feels so true that yes. We are asking people to accept the unknown or accept the uncertainty of something that in, in most likelihood, and I, I, you know, I know we want to say this, we don't want to do that reassurance thing, but it's not going to happen, but you can't hang your hat on. It's not going to happen, but your brain is telling you, no, 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 it's going to happen. So from right. an internal experience standpoint, I am literally accepting death, even though, you know, from the outside looking in, Drew, you're not going to die. I know you're not going to die. You, you're okay now. Yeah. But my internal experience is I am choosing to intentionally go and die. Yep. That's why it's so hard. And that's why you're having a hard time navigating most likely. Because yes. to you, I, it is legitimately, you are choosing this horrible fate that you believe is real because your brain has taken you hostage and told you that it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I do try to bring back people to the uncertainty because of the fact that we don't, we don't want people to live in, Oh, I'm going to murder my family because that's also right. not true. Right. Like right. Uh, right. you could is, is really, and like, just like you could die. And yeah. of course, yeah, I, I think the the point that you make about most people know, right. At some level is true. And most people who are in it will say on one level they don't believe it, and then on another level they're still terrified that it's that it's secretly true or that they're de deluding themselves. Or so it's it's a tricky thing, and that's where it's like, I, and I I have to tell people in in session this all the time. I'm like, but you don't know, right? Yeah. That's the problem. Is uh, I know this isn't going to happen. I'm like, you don't though, and that's that is what's keeping you stuck is that you don't know and you're unwilling to not know. So you yeah. could say that you know, but realistically that's just not the case. So let's let's get better at not knowing. And so navigation through the trigger when it happens for me was just to kind of bring it back to the original yeah. premise here was the acceptance of okay, this is what's actually happening and now I'm 
now you're going to have to kill me. So I'm going to have to accept this possible situation that I'm so afraid of that has never actually happened. But in my brain, I'm accepting, okay, go ahead, let this happen. And then it was action. Then yeah. it was action toward what I really wanted to do, which in that moment, I didn't want to drive out of, away from the house. I didn't want to do that. But on the bigger picture of my life, that is what I wanted to do. So I had to, to choose to move slowly, relaxed, mindfully, as best I can. Relax, not calm. Relax and calm are two different things. Try to be relaxed as best I can and move toward things that were actually long-term goals, which is not normal for human beings. We want to act based on what we want now. Totally. It, it was hard to get into that group, but it's like, nope, if I go and do this now, I know that I will be happy. I will thank myself in three months. Yes. Yeah. So I yeah. that was navigating. Navigating was I'm not going to try to navigate through this circumstance right this minute. That feels so important. I'm going to try to navigate toward what's what's mm. waiting for me in three or six months. Oh, I love that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Because, well, because what you're talking about too, we're looking at the idea of navigation as a whole is that you've got your compass bearings on the thing that you want. Mm. And simultaneously, you may that may mean you'll hit a rough patch immediately as a, as a direct result, but you're not going off course because that, that would deter you from the things that matter. Um, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. And just to sort of bring it back, cause I love that you, <laughs> we, you know, pull it, Try. pull it all back together. <laughs> um, if, if we're looking at it from the OCD perspective and my own experience that navigating those moments looked like, oh, I'm having thoughts that I might have relapsed and that maybe I'm lying to myself and that I'm a terrible person and that I'll live a lie, right? These were the, the things that my brain did. And then I'd have this surge of anxiety and this really strong desire to figure it out. I'd, I'd be aware, right? Like would start with the awareness, then go into, okay, this is what's happening, acceptance. And then I would go toward maybe, Maybe, maybe I did relapse. Maybe I am a horrible person. Maybe, mm. maybe I'm going to live a lie. Maybe, maybe no one else will ever know the real me. Okay. I'd, maybe. I don't know. I'm, but I'm going to keep um, driving because that's what I'm doing right now. So right. I don't have time to figure that out. I've got, I've got more important things. So I'm going to make space for the the thoughts that are here that I'm a liar and that I'm a terrible person and I'm going to accept the feelings too the the dropping in my stomach and the tightening in my chest and all, what have you so that I can continue on and it feels risky because I need to sort this out right but I'm not gonna I'm Yeah and, and it risk. feels risky it feels like I need to sort this out right now like right, now. I, I, right now I need to be focused on the here and now I, I'm uncomfortable right now. I'm uncertain right now. I'm afraid right now. So I think if, if anything, and I, I don't know if you would agree with this or not, the best navigation tip, the internet is completely chock full of like here and now feel better this minute navigation tips. So we're not going to do that. You can go find them somewhere else. And, and, and I hope you don't. But in the end, the navigation is not in the here and now. The navigation is pointed toward the future. Please don't. <laughs> Please don't do that. Um, Please don't. Yeah. So does that? Yeah. That, that, that's, that's <laughs> I, mean. I don't mean don't watch us. Those things are not necessarily productive. So if you came here <laughs> hoping to find, you know, 10 things to make your panic attacks, uh, I'm sorry that we disappointed you, but navigate toward where you want to be as a recovered person. That's navigation through the trigger. Yes. Take the steps that you that the person that you want to be. Very good. You know, even though that compass is, even, there's a big magnet though. behind you that keeps changing your compass. Yeah. 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 We're having like, internet hey, problems. Hey, but, but wait, go over there. It's going to be better. Nope. Oh, we are having internet problems. Well, probably on my end. It's okay. And I apologize, gang, but. That's all right. We're at 34 minutes. For, anyway, uh, so another it's great chat. Nice. Yeah, it's always fun. And these always go a little bit off the rails, but then I think we bring them back. So hopefully it's been helpful for everybody listening or watching. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. I will put yeah. up, uh, for those of you who do not know Miss Lauren, this is where she is at, at The Obsessive Mind. Or are you, theobsessivemind.com is your website too? 
I remember that is actually my website as well. Yes, you, you nailed it. There you go. So that's how you and get it. So if you do not follow Lauren, then go and do that. Oh, I guess I got to put mine up too. Yeah, you got to put yours up. And this, if you can hear me still, is <laughs> Drew's information. You can find him at the.anxious.truth. And uh, it's theanxioustruth.com too, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It happens to be theanxioustruth.com. So there you go. See, there you go. All right, peeps. Thanks for coming by. I'm sure we'll do this again next month like we always do. Don't know what we're going to talk about, but we'll be back. It's going to be a surprise. Fire and I coming at you. <laughs> <laughs> coming at you again. So. Anyway, all right, guys. We'll see you next time. Thanks for coming yeah. by. Bye. Awkwardly, I'm recording.